So I think that's why to me, the job is more of like a service job. You know, I think there's two things in making a, a real estate agent successful and it's making sure that you're providing value, making sure that you're providing service and at the same time, building a relationship with that person throughout that time. You, you know, you pretty much married for 45, 60 days, 70 days, 90 days. That's your opportunity now to say, hey, look, this is who I am and this is what I like to do and this is how I can help you and anybody else you know. So service. David Kerr's looking clean with his whole sales team. We ain't come to talk nonsense. It's all about the process and profits until we make a billion from deposits. He never slack and teach him to take action. So far from whack and never gave up his passion. Can't catch him lacking, dapper down on his fashion. He forever stacking, running up all the cash. In. Real estate mastermind. Check out his book. He gave us the blueprint. I really can't hate the grind. Put in the work, no making excuses. I all right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Freedom Achiever Podcast. My name is David Kurz, founder of the Freedom Organization, a coaching and consulting company. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Freedom Achiever Podcast. As you know, our consistent battle is to ensure that we bring people to the table that are 100% freedom achievers. And the reason that we do that is because we want to make sure that they bring life stories, business stories, anecdotes, things that happen to them, things that will help you in your life, in your career, help you become a freedom achiever, whatever that means to you, whatever your special freedom is, whether it be time, whether it be financial, whether it be location, we want to help you find that. And so we bring people on the show that have time freedom, location freedom, financial freedom, are having fun with their lives so that you can pull away from it today. Super excited to have Richard on with us. Richard's hailing out of Orlando area, that Lake Nona area, that sexy part of Orlando, by the way. You know, <laughs> I know when I asked you what part of town you're from, you're like Orlando. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not just Orlando, yeah, Lake no, Nona. Nona. Yeah, make it, very, <laughs> make it very clear, the sexy part. The sexy I like part. That's I, like, like, that's, I like the way you referenced it, the sexy part. I like that. It is, man. Like like Lake Nona is that super sought after kind of area in Orlando, man. Yeah, it is right now, especially for the last. So I've been I've been in this area uh, about seven eight years now, but yeah, I would say that for the last three to six years, it's been been crazy. Fire, it's like been it's a, been lot, fire. a lot of a lot of growth. Um, a lot of people moving into the area. Um, even outside the area, even people you know, not even in the Orlando, you know, even across the country, California, they they've heard of Lake Nona, so. Yeah. Yeah. Huge, huge. So let's let's dig into some facts. You've been in the real estate market five, six years. What did you do before real estate? I worked at Mercedes Benz. So I worked for um, okay. one of the local Mercedes franchise stores here in Central Florida. Um, a lot of times when I say that people think I worked in the um, sales side of things. I didn't work in sales. I actually worked. I worked. Well, I worked sales, actually, but I worked more in the parts sales. So, you know, if you went to the dealership and you had to buy a part for your car or you had to get your vehicle service or something like that, I was one of the um, one of the people you would kind of engage with. Nice. OK, so I immediately went to sales because that's what I do. Right. Sales. Yeah, it happens all the time. People are like, oh, you sold cars. I'm like, no, I never sold cars. Yeah. And, and by the way, like not a whole thing to do. Right. But but it would have been, I guess, a more ideological kind of transition to go from sales to sales like auto yeah. sales to real estate sales. You didn't do that. You went from service to sales. Yeah. And I think, and, and you know, I, I know it's early in the podcast, you know, digging into this. I think the, a big part of my success in real estate is I don't really consider real estate sales. I don't, I, I truly consider real estate more of a service. I, I truly do. But if you want, I'll save that for later. No, man. I, listen, bro, let's dig into it. Right. right. So let's go. And, it. and by so the way, I, like, we're, we're going to tap into this because there's, look, man, I have a theory. I'm financially driven. Like if you do my, you know, my, 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 my personality profile, you know, I'm super driven, but I'm also financially driven. Right. So when I coach or when I talk to people, I'm like, look, dude, I understand you want to help people. I understand you have a great heart, but at the end of the day, what are we really trying to do? Make some money, put money in the bank. You know, we're trying to make some money because otherwise we'd be working for fucking charity. Right. So we'd like like we'd sell houses and say, cool, I don't need the money. Just give it all to the children. Right. Get it like, all back. Yeah. Yeah. But but no, we don't do that. We close deals so we can make money so we can have a lifestyle so we can take care of our family, take care of our own, take care of ourselves. Um, 
And so, so, so when you say, I don't consider real estate a sales position, I consider it more of a service position. Talk to me more about that. I just feel, you know, in real estate, the hardest thing is always meeting somebody, right? The hardest thing is always finding somebody that wants to buy a house, finding someone that wants to sell a house. After that, to me, you know, if you meet someone and they loyal working with you and they are working with you, I look at it after that, the process is more of like a service job. Like, you know, you, yeah. it's about communication. It's about, you know, making sure that you're listening to the things they need. It's no different than, I don't know. I look at it as no different. If you pull into Mercedes Benz right now and you're like, Hey Richard, I have an issue with my vehicle. My vehicle is making X, Y, Z noise. I don't know where the noise is coming from. My job as a service consultant is to have one of the technicians diagnose it. And then obviously, you know, let you know, what's going on with your vehicle. But at the same time, a lot of people don't know this. Those jobs and all those dealerships are commission-based jobs, right? So yeah. even though you're going there for a service and even though they're providing you a service, when they sell you brake pads, tires, air filters, wipers, whatever the case is for your vehicle, they get a certain percentage of that sale. Same they're thing. As, exactly. Same thing as the people selling the parts for the cars, right? They get a certain percentage of that sale. So I think, you know, with me, my mindset with real estate is people know what they want to buy. I don't have to convince someone to buy a house. I don't have to convince someone to move into a certain area. They know where they want to be. They know what they, they tell you that if you have a buyer's consultation with them or something like that, they tell you out front, like I want four bedrooms, three bathrooms. I work from home. I have an office. I need 2,400 square feet. This is important to me. That's important to me. The rest is history. You're just to provide them options and say, hey, this is what's available out there. Um, These are the homes that... I see kind of fit your need, show them at the point, at some point, they're going to pick what they like. And that's just it. So I think that's why to me, the job is more of like a service job. You know, I think there's two things in making a, a real estate agent successful and it's making sure that you're providing value, making sure that you're providing service. And at the same time, building a relationship with that person throughout that time, you, you know, you pretty much married for 45, 60 days, 70 days, 90 days. That's your opportunity now to say, hey, look, this is who I am and this is what I like to do and this is how I can help you and anybody else you know. So service. So do you think so do you think that your approach is an approach that has helped you get to you know 39, 40 million dollars in business last year? 100 percent 100 percent I, I was just people appreciate that approach because they don't feel like they're getting sold. I think people appreciate that approach more because I think there's so many agents out there that are, you know, gung ho on a lot of sales tactics and a lot of sales scripts that they just stick into the scripts. They stick into the sales. Um, they stick into a, just a lot of stuff that just has to do with sales. And I'm a little bit different. You know, if you walk into, if I'm doing an open house in my, in my area and you walk into an open house in my area and there's times I jump in the car and I'm just like, Oh, so-and-so is having an open house over here. I don't know who this agent is. I'm just going to pop up and let's just see. Like, and I'll be in regular clothes, you know, and I'll just walk in and, you know, I get questions that are just crazy. Like, are you looking to buy a house? Are you pre-approved? Are you working with a lender? And it's all just sales stuff. You know, it's all just like, it's focused on the deal. I'm different. You know, I'm like, I want to ask questions about, are you new to this area? Or do you know this area? Right? Because if you say to me, I'm new to the area, then my job now is I want to become your your one-stop shop information center, right? Like, I, so now I need to let you know that I'm the local expert here and this is my area and I know my area very well and I'm going to tell you about it and I'm going to talk to you about schools. I'm going to talk to you about communities. I'm going to talk to you about what there is to do. I'm going to talk to you about the restaurants because at that point, I'm a hyper-local expert. Now, if you tell me you live in the area, even better, right? Because then I know high chance you probably own a house around here um, and it's a high chance where do you live in the area, right? Oh, I might live in, oh, I live in Randall Park. Really? I live in Randall Park. What street do you live on? Oh, I live on so-and-so. Really? I live on this street. It's funny. We're neighbors, you know, and then at that point I just met a neighbor. So I don't ask the sales pitch questions. My, my goal on all of this stuff is coming from, coming from contribution and providing some kind of value and information that these people can take with them and walk away and go, I like that guy. That guy didn't try to sell me. That guy gave me info. So how do you, man, all right. So, so, you know, it's funny because when you, when you talk to somebody who's smart about what they do, 
no matter how many times in the beginning of the podcast you go, this podcast is not about real estate, <laughs> right? And then you go, fuck, we're talking about real estate for 10 minutes now. But yeah. <laughs> but but here's 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 a theory for you. So so the way that I coach real estate agents is very similar in that sense, right? But I'm very clear about the fact that we're in this to make money, right? And so what I teach is relationship development or what in our coaching program, what we call RDEV. And so in, in RDEV, what we're doing is we're creating relationships that allow us to understand problems that help us bring solutions so we can provide value. Therefore, value would create dollars and cents. And, and it sounds like very much that's what you're doing in a sense. But, I mean, very similar because, again, it, you know, I, I think – yeah, you can put it that way. You know, I also think it also kind of creates like what I want to do is create this kind of like circle of trust, you know, that, a relationship. Yeah. That at this point they feel like, Hey, look, you know, like, let's face it. You said it a second ago, like we all want to make money. Like, you know, eventually yeah. a sale does come from it. However, if you, you know, go back to the very beginning, if you create that trust and you create that relationship and you create that bond with these people where they feel like, this is my guy. This is who I'm going to go with. The sale comes. The sale follows. You know, then, then the referrals come, and then all the other stuff that comes after yeah, that. All comes. the good stuff comes, right? Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, what's your average sales price? Well, I'll have to look that up for you. I would have to say probably just a guess, man. Ballpark four, four seventy, maybe four, okay, maybe four cool. seventy five. Maybe so, five, so, four, so four seventy, four seventy five. If you're hitting forty million, you're you're selling a lot of damn houses, right? So last year was my question, Yeah. So my question to you is, how much time? And now, now I want to dig into family life a little bit because I understand the dynamic of being an over, overachieving individual, and and when you're an overachieving individual that is hyper focused on what you're doing, because let's be real, you came from Mercedes Benz service department. You had hours. You clocked in, you clocked out. The family knew when you were going to be gone. The family knew when you were going to be home. Your wifey, who you've been married to for 22 years, she knew the schedule. Now there is no schedule, right? How do you, how, how have you been able to transition because you've been in the industry five, six years, how have you been able to transition from that to this? And how does, how does your wife specifically cope with it? Um, I mean, she's pretty good with it just for the simple fact that, you know, we had this conversation going into it. You know, we we, yeah. we knew we knew what the plan was like, you know, we knew that if, you know, we wanted to be successful and we wanted the business to really blossom, we knew that it was going to require time and there was going to be a sacrifice and time was going to be a sacrifice. And, you know, it was it was funny because we just had this conversation maybe like four months ago and we were talking about it. And, you know, and I told I remember saying to her. You know, my at the time I forgot how old my son was, but I remember saying to her, I think he was like three or something, and I remember saying or two, whatever. But I remember saying to her, "Give me till he turns seven, like give me till he turns seven. I'm gonna hit this shit like hard till he turns seven, and let's see where he's at when he's turned seven. Because I, I told her, because I believe if I do it this way, by the time he turns seven, we're gonna be in a position where this thing is kind of gonna keep running itself and." You know, we won't have to hit it so hard the way we hit it. And it was a lot of sacrifice, man. Like I was, you know, I would leave the house 9 a.m. I won't get home sometimes. So 9, 10 o'clock at night, attending networking events, you know, going out there, just doing all the things that I could possibly do to just get in front of people, you know, and, um, you know, doing what I had to do to grow the business. So it was, it was hard. You know, at some point, you know, we did hit like a little bumpy stage, you know, where I think, you know, it started to get to a point where, she was probably feeling like it was never going to end. Um, you know, even though we knew we, we, you know, even though we knew we committed to a certain amount of time, I think it started getting to a point where she, she felt alone, you know, and now, and I wasn't yeah. there and, you know, and, and I think it took me to a couple months ago, maybe like last year, it was last year. It was around the holidays actually. Cause I remember buying season passes for me and my, me and my son to go to Halloween Horror Nights and um, there was one day that I asked my son, I said, uh, do you want to go over here with me or do you want to go with mom over there? And I remember my son's response, man. It was crazy. I'll never forget it. My son literally looked at me and said, 
I've already spent my whole life with mom. It's time for me to spend my time with you. And, and, and I think, you know, as an adult, I think what I really heard my son say was, dad, you haven't been around for the last seven years and I'm taking advantage now. <laughs> you, I'm gonna come hang out with you. My wife's like, no, no, that's not what he said. And I was like, no, no, no that's, that's no, what he said. That's, said it that's exactly what he said. That's exactly, that's what, exactly he said. what he said. You know, and- um, how, did, how, did that, how did that hit you? Because I've been I've been down that road, so I, I like I know how it hit me. How did that like? It hit. How was that impact? It hit, but at the same time, it was like, like it hit. Like a part of me was like, "Damn, man! Like this kid feels like I'm not here, and um, and he's on his own." And then the other part of it, I kind of felt like, "Well, I did say he gave me till he's seven, and he's seven. And we hear like so, you know, knock it, you know, say what you want to say. Um, the plan worked. It worked. It worked. You know, it worked and it worked and exactly, you know, like my timing on it was perfect. But but Richard, let me ask you this. <laughs> this would be this is the fun question, right? Because I know me and I'm kind of getting you your vibe right now. Is it over? No, nah, it ain't over. It ain't over, dude. You know, now I don't know. I don't know. Like, like, I know. like, working, listen. I don't know about you, but I'm addicted to this shit. Some, I'm, I think I'm working on some things that, if things do work out, you know, I could get back. I think the time is going to be the most valuable uh, with my son, and it's going to be evenings and weekends. You know, yeah. If, so yeah. yeah, you know, weekdays. Like, look, man, it's a job. There's still going to be work to do. I'm not going to be sitting on the couch. My son's a se he's seven year old, so he's in second grade. Like, he's got school. Right, he's got things to do. Yeah, um, but I want to be able to. You know, say like, "Hey, you want to go sign up for?" You know, he wants he likes he likes, he likes soccer, right? He wants to play soccer. Yeah. You know, soccer is hard. It requires you know practice three days a week, Saturdays, Sundays. His kids got games. Like, I can't, I can't dedicate myself to that right now. I just can't. Yeah. But you know, yeah. I want to get, I want to get to a point where I could say, like, "Yeah, let's do that." You want to do that this weekend? Like, it's all about you. Let's go. So, is it over? It's not over. There's still some things to work on. There's some tweaking, uh, some things that need to be tweaked. Um, there's some adjustments to be made. Um, but do I see the light? I see it, bro. I see it very, very yeah. bright. I could put my sunglasses on for that one. It's that bright. It's that bright. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, I can feel, I can feel exactly what you're saying, and that's why I asked, "Is it over?" Because when you, when, when you're a driven individual, it's very hard to turn it off, you know. And like I said, I'm, I'm addicted to this. I love what I do, you know. Like I, and, and my plate is full. I run a real estate team in South Florida. I own a coaching company that's becoming a national brand and I, and I'm a partner in a title company. That's a semi-national title company. So not only am I managing my sales team down South, I'm doing my coaching calls. I'm attracting new coaching business. I'm hosting podcasts. I'm creating attention. I'm doing my reels. I have my social media people. I have my assistant. I have my other assistant, like, you know, and we're planning a conference for March 9th. I got another one November 9th. Like we are consistently, you know, on the push, on the push, on the push. And and my wife looks at me. She goes, why don't you just like do one thing? And I'm like, babe, I don't know how to fucking do one thing. Like I just, I don't know how to do one thing, you know? And, I, and, and that's what I was going to say right now that I, you know, maybe you're right. You know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm just like, yeah, it's over. And maybe it's like. No, there's gonna be something new and some and a nice new goal with a nice new shiny object attached to it. Where it's I'm gonna be too like, much fun building a business, I'm gonna, man. Like, oh, I'm gonna be like, oh snap! Like this is a good opportunity over here. Let me go run with this, you know? Because in, in the very beginning of the call, like you know, when you before we even started recording this, I asked you, you know, what you do, and you mentioned the coaching and stuff like that. And it's wild because that's kind of really where I'm almost trying to pivot my business to, you know, into a coaching more, into more of like a coaching platform. So again, you know, that's going to require time. And if, and like you just said right now, conferences, all these other things that I'm going to be planning, well, that requires me to be away anyway. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll see adjustments will have to be made, but they'll work. I'll make, I'll make it listen, work. It does, I've learned, I've it learned does get stressful. you, you make time for what you want to make time for. Like, and that's just, yeah. you make time. There it is. hundred percent. You make time for what you want to make time for. If it's important to you and it's a priority to you, you will make time for it. Hands down. I spent uh, I spent I spent last week in St. Petersburg at a conference, uh, Monday through Thursday. The week before that, Monday through Friday, I was in San Antonio, Texas, building our title company. Like I'm so like, 
you know, and then by the way, while I'm Texas, it doesn't mean that like I cancel all my, my coaching appointments. Like those are, conti- those are still go. You know yeah. I mean? So, so I still, you know, as long as I got Wi-Fi, I'm still on the hustle, you know, I'm still making it happen. And, and it's, really and it's Wi-Fi. like a hotspot. Like, yeah, bro, listen, I, I just need to connect to zoom and I can work and email, you know, and, and I really, I'm addicted to this, man. I'm addicted I, to this. And I'll tell you, you, you want to laugh? Like, people are like, dude, how do you fit things in? Like, you know, like like certain things, like, I, you know, I make time to go to my daughter's volleyball games or go hang out with my other kids or, you know, travel or whatever the case is. Like, so I've been wanting to put a flagpole in the front of my house for like the longest time. I just never came around to doing it. My buddy who's, so I was in the Marine Corps, so I want to fly my American and Marine Corps flag, right? And so a buddy of mine who's in the Navy, he just sent me a picture of his flagpole. And so that motivated me. I was like, oh, hold on a second, man. You put up a flagpole. He's like, dude, it's super easy to put up. Send me the info. I ordered that shit, came to the house. I kid you not, 30 seconds before I logged into this Zoom call or to this, to this, to this podcast, I was pouring concrete. <laughs> 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 and that's how I fit things in because I don't look at, you know, nine to five. I know that I have this and I've got two more appointments after this and two more calls, but I have this, this two hour gap between my last meeting and this meeting. And I was like, what, what am I going to do? You know, what can I do that's productive during this two hour gap? Rolled out to home Depot, picked up some concrete, got a couple buckets, you know what I mean? And, and a new shovel. Dug it up. Up. And sometimes yeah, you don't dug out a two foot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and so I had to do what I had to do in the time that was allotted to me. You know, I told and, myself and, on Saturday, I, I went out like I had an open house, went on some showing, showed homes to like three different families, took my son to a soccer game. And I get home at night and I'm just like, bro, how the hell do I make time for all this shit? Like, like, how did I even do all of this in a day? Yeah. So trust me, I get it. We're capable. We're yeah, capable. I so. Yeah, you I guess know? Like I said, it's all about how bad you want it, right? If you want it and you'll make it work, man, you'll, you'll figure out the time for it. All right. So 22 years married, what's the secret sauce? There isn't any, man. It's just, I guess, (laughs) I don't know. I I don't know. Marriage is, marriage is is crazy. It's complicated. I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a secret sauce. You know, I think, um, you know, trust is a huge thing. Um, Communication is extremely, extremely important. I mean, I'm an over communicator, so it don't really matter, you know, what I'm doing or where I'm at. If I'm moving from point A to point B, I'm at least shooting a text that says I'm moving from point A to point B. Um, ain't going to be like, hey, I didn't know you stopped there. So, um, so you know, I think communication is huge, you know. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know, man. It's this, there's a lot in marriages that um, that could be good and there's things that could be bad. But um, I think for me, I would have to say communication in my marriage, ultimately, is probably the most healthiest thing um, that there is. Making sure, making sure we're on the same, making sure we're on the same page. You know, for our goals. How'd you guys meet? Oh, it's funny, man. Somebody just asked me that this morning too. Uh, we actually met through a mutual cousin of mine. My cousin worked at oh, McDonald's. Okay. Yeah, my cousin worked at McDonald's, and my wife worked at McDonald's uh, with her, and they both went to high school together. And you know, I don't know. Back in the days, you know, the girls used to carry these big wallets, and they have pictures in their wallets. Like remember the wallets used to have the pictures in them, the printed pictures. Yeah, 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 yeah. My cousin had a picture of uh, my wife in her wallet. She was a friend of hers from school, and I remember just you know we were sitting down watching the Yankees in the Mets World Series in 2000, and um, she pulled out her wallet to do something, and she was flapping through, and I was like, "Yo, who's your friend?" You know, and I saw I kind of saw her, and you know she introduced me to her, and her me and my wife became friends for a while, and we kind of exchanged numbers, and we would just you know just talk like casual, just talk like friends, and. You know, you know, as time progressed, one thing led to another. And I'm going to be honest, I don't even think we ever made it even formal, to be honest. We just started dating. <laughs> happen that way. And, um, yeah, man, and it's six just years, I think six years in, seven years in, we got married and been together yeah, ever since. Yeah. That's freaking awesome. Man. So yeah, together 22 years or married 22 years? Together 22, 20, 23 years together. <laughs> married, I mean, take six away from that. I'm about to yeah. Man. I'm yeah, yeah. No Thanks worries. Man. No worries. So, so I remember the subway series because I was stationed in California at the time. I was stationed at Port Wainimi, 
I was a Marine Corps liaison to the Naval CBs for weapon systems. And I remember that that series because I had a bunch of people in my house. So so now I got to ask you, Yankees or Mets? That's tough, man. So I'm a big Yankees fan by heart, but I grew up, okay. in, Queens, but I grew up in Queens at my favorite uh. baseball. Yeah. And my favorite baseball player ever um, is a Met. So it's kind of like weird. I'm a big Howard Johnson fan. Um, always okay. Was fan as a kid um so um so yeah i would have to say I, i'm gonna go with the yankees man like the yankees, is yankees. <laughs> so, man, i have love like but i have love for the mess this, this podcast was about to be over bro <laughs> if, this is, if this is a subway series and like they're going against each other like i almost like whoever wins it's a win it don't matter if it's new yeah. york you know, yeah. i don't care um, not, in, not in my house so 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 in my house um i'll tell you a quick story in my house we uh i grew up in the bronx and so in my house, my stepfather was a big Mets fan. And so we would literally go see Mets games, which was annoying to me because we would hop on the four train and we would pass right by Yankee Stadium and then be on the train for an hour to get the Shea Stadium. Well, that's what it was at the time. Far, yeah, it's a far trip across the Queens. Yeah, we would go to Shea Stadium and we would buy some cheap ass tickets because we didn't have a lot of money. And he would bring a little radio with him with an antenna so he could listen to the game in Spanish. And we'd be on the top, 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 like nosebleeders, look like ants were playing baseball. It never made sense to me. You know what I mean? And 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 I one day I asked him, I said, Ben, why don't why don't we just go to a Yankee game? It's right there. And he was like, No, we're Mets fans. And I was like, ah, you know. And so one day I was going, I was going to the grocery store. I'll never forget this shit. I, I know this story like like it was yesterday. My mom writes me a note to buy a can of Budweiser. And so back in the day, you could go to the bodega with a note from your mom that said to give you a Budweiser and they give you a Budweiser, right? Yeah, yeah, you didn't need to be like 21 and over, you know? And uh, and I get the Budweiser and I'm walking back and uh, and and my mom was making carne guisao, which for, for you English folks, that's like a beef stew. Yeah, and like we're, yeah, and, and we're, we're, I'm walking back home and this kid who was like the local drug dealer on my block calls me over. He's like, yo, D, come here. So I run across the street. I'm like, what's up? And he's like, I got these two tickets to the Yankee game. I can't go. See if your mom will let you go. I was like, cool. I ran home. I went to my stepfather first. I got these two tickets to the Yankee game. Can we go? He goes, no, I'm not going. So I go to my mom and I'm like, yo, and I'm kind of young, but back in that day, it was okay to let your kid on the train, you know? And so I go to my mom, can I go to the game? She goes, if you can find a friend, call my boy Anthony on the sixth floor. Yo, aunt, I got two tickets to the Yankee game. Bet. We get in the train, we go to the Yankee game, we go to check in at the front, we give the lady the tickets and she goes, all right, boy, stand right here on the corner. And now I'm nervous because we're young you got and I just got tickets dealer. from a drug dealer you know what I mean? And, and, and I, I'm like, why are we standing on the corner? Why can't we just go to our seats? I didn't know what I had in my hand. And this usher comes out and he's like, he looks at us. He goes, you boys with the tickets? I'm like, yeah. He goes, all right, come on, let's go. And I was like, all right. And we walked in, my dog. We had box seats, row one, first base with Don Mattingly on first base back in the day. That's and like every hair on my body stood when I sat down in that chair, like I could lean over the wall and touch the dirt. You know what I mean? That's and, sick. Uh, and Don Madley comes out and he's like, he, you know, headed to the base for warm up. And we start screaming, Don, 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 you know, like to try to get his attention. And he turns around, looks it up, he, and he goes, What's up, boys? Enjoy the game. And I was like, oh, Don Madley fucking talks to me. You know, like <laughs> he talked to me. I know he did. Your friends like, no, me, no, and, me. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. and and crazy story. I went home and I told my stepfather that I was a Yankee fan. And it became the rivalry in our house. We never went to another baseball game together again. That's funny. That's crazy. That's how that's how strong baseball in new york is right like is. we it's never went. listen i was still i was still young and my like, stepfather and i never went to another game together ever again that's crazy you guys drew you guys, you guys drew like a line in the sand like that's yeah yeah it was a line in the sand and i if 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 i went to a game with him 
I expected him to go to a game with me. And since he wasn't, he wasn't willing to go to Yankee Stadium, not even we just never went. It, he wasn't doing it. Yeah, we never we like we never went to another game again. And it, and and then my brother was born when I was eight. My brother was born, my little brother, and he grew up a Mets fan because he is my stepfather's son. Son, you yeah. know. And so he grew up a Mets fan, followed sure dad's footsteps. That route. And then that became a big rivalry in our house. I was the only Yankee fan. The rest of my house was Mets fans. And I couldn't understand it because we lived in the Bronx. Just didn't make no, no, it didn't make natural sense to me. You know what I mean? And so, so that was it. And the next time I went to a game with my brother, it was in Marlins Park. And it was Mets Marlins. And it was only because he came with me in the preseason to see the Yankees Marlins play. So the only right? reason we went, huh? It was King Griffey on the no, team? No, uh, Miami Marlins. Oh, Miami. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Miami. And and so yeah. we played. We saw Miami play. We saw Miami play the Yankees in the preseason, and then and then we saw the the, and then we saw the Mets play Miami. In, in the in the regular season. And the only reason I went with him to see the Mets was because he came with me to see the Yankees. Legit, like that. So and watch. we still, we walked in, me wearing my Yankee hat, That's him wearing his Mets hat. Yeah. Hey <laughs> I, listen, I went to Fenway. Like, I went to Fenway two years ago, um, my first time in Fenway. I went in there with all my Yankee stuff on. They treated me nice, actually. Yeah, actually, I was surprised how nice really? the fans were. Me. Yeah, I was surprised how nice the fans were. Me. At first, I was scared. I was like, man, I don't know about you wearing this shit here. Like, yeah, I'm because you hear cool. stories, man. Yeah. You hear and stories. And then I got there, and they were just like super nice. And I was like, I'm in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I married my wife, and long and behold, she's a Boston fan. Oh shit, bro, you, you messed up. Yeah, man. bro. And so, so, so I asked her. I was like, okay, I never seen you watch baseball or ever talk about it. Why are you a Boston fan? Of course, Big Poppy. Yeah. I was about to say that that, that, that that my era. Wife, that era. My, she my wife is Dominican. She's Dominican. Oh, so am I. So am I. <laughs> I'm Dominican too, so that makes sense. Yeah. That makes you know her whole family loves Boston only because that's like the Dominican breeding ground for the MLB, bro. Yeah, at the time <laughs> at that era it was because they had Pedro, they had Big Poppy. Everybody um, had everybody, bro. Yeah, the Dominican they that's how they became a huge Dominican fan base that year. That well, that era. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. I ran into Big Poppy at a cigar bar here in Miami, and, and believe it or not, it wasn't like a super big popular one. It was it's one of the small ones that that we go to, and we pull up, and there was like this beautiful freaking Rolls Royce outside, and the whole nine. We walk inside, and my boy's with me. He goes, "Yo, that's Big Poppy sitting in the corner right there." <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, we that's sat down like around Miami. here. You know? It's Miami too, so I guess those guys probably just roll around over there, probably like nothing. Yeah, it was like just nothing. a it, it wasn't like a spot that you expected to run into someone of that stature, you know what I mean? That's it almost feels like yeah, it almost feels like he had a friend around that area and they were like, Hey, I got this kind of quiet cigar spot down the street, and he went, you know, like it's not a big busy bar type spot, like you gotta bring your own liquor with you, type spot, you know what I mean? And and he was chilling. He was chilling. Yeah, that's cool, man. That shows, you know? humble. that shows his humble. Yeah, it was different. He spoke to us too. You know, we walked him outside. You know, yeah. I got a picture with him somewhere, but yeah, he's super cool. Super cool. That's I made sure he cool. knew I was a Yankees fan. <laughs> <laughs> he don't care. He don't care about that no more. Maybe he back don't then. Care about that, bro. At, at all. Then, at all. Maybe back then he probably took the fuck off, but not anymore. Yeah, not anymore. He doesn't care. He's super funny and just chill. He was he was a good dude. Like he took pictures with us and everything. You know, that's awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I used to meet Shaq all the time when I worked at Mercedes, and it was the same thing. Man, Shaquille O'Neal was like, "Hey, you want to take a picture?" Bell was like, even I met (laughs) met another person. I met Miguel Cotto, a boxer. Same thing, man. Yeah, I met met Miguel Cotto. He came up to me. And like introduce some stuff to me, and I'm like, no, bro, I I know who you are. Like, like <laughs> yeah. So yeah, really. So cool speaking dude. of boxing, are you a boxing fan? Yes, I am. How do you feel about? Let, let me word this appropriately. How do you feel about uh, uh, Jake Paul and boxing? 
I'll be honest, honest. You know, I I actually kind of like it. I actually kind of like it, and I'll tell you why. Um, because I feel like, bro, we live in a country where, like, you know, we tell all we tell our kids growing up, like, you could do anything you want, like, you can achieve anything, like. So it's actually pretty cool to see, you know, this dude say all of a sudden, like, yo, I want to be a boxer, and I'm gonna go out there. I got all these millions of dollars, and I could do anything else I want in the world, but I like boxing. And I want to box and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to train and I'm going to fight professionals and I'm going to be a professional fighter. And he's doing it, you know, and he's doing it, but, but do you think that do you? So I feel like he's making a mockery of boxing. Like, I feel like he's trying to turn boxing into what wrestling is. And and that's killing me because. But I think, you know, I think, I think, I think Floyd Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather already did that. I think Floyd Mayweather. I think that's what Floyd Mayweather did. Not his whole sure. career. I think that's what Floyd Mayweather did. You know, around when he fought Oscar De La Hoya moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I guess, man. I, I, um, you know, the, 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 uh, um, you know, Oscar like I don't know if you know this or if you've seen. Fight. I don't know if you know this or if you've seen the news, but Jake Paul is set to fight Mike Tyson Mike in July. Tyson. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Tyson's 60 some years old, bro. Yeah, he's probably gonna kill Mike. Probably won't kill him, but he'll hurt. But he Mike probably won't. I mean, I don't but know. But then the other part is that Mike's no punk. So he ain't no punk. So it's gonna be good to see what happens. Yeah, but the but so so here's the thing. People are saying, I hope Mike Tyson whoops his ass. Other people are saying, like it's a lose-lose situation, right? So, like, like if Mike Tyson wins, all he did was kick some YouTubers butt. Right. Correct. If he loses, he's too old. He's like done. You know, like he's like, I can't believe Mike Tyson just lost to this YouTuber. Right. Like it's a lose lose situation for Mike Tyson, other than the purse, other than the money he's gonna make. You know, for for money, but for for the other guy, for Jake Paul, if he wins, they're gonna go, dude, you just beat up a 60-something-year-old dude. You just beat up your grandpa. Yep. Because you're 20 something. I agree with you. And again, you know? I think I think a fight like that is is, you know, a stage, fight to like maybe. I, I think so. I think so. I think those are stage. I mean, I don't know what Mike Tyson's financials look like, um, but he's doing fine, by the way. You know, I don't think he's hurting, but I mean, you never know. I don't know, think man. he's hurting. Let's look it up right now. Let's go, Mike Tyson. We did have like Tyson like that back in the day, so you know, I don't know. I don't know. It says he's got an estimated net worth of ten million. I mean, for Mike Tyson, that's not a lot, actually. I would expect it more. I mean, it's not a lot. That's but because Mike, he was out there, you know, that's he was out there buying tigers and shit when he was in his prime. <laughs> like <laughs> the dude was buying lions and tigers, bro. He was. It was crazy. Remember that? Yeah. He would like walk around yeah. his house. Yeah, I remember he had the tiger in the backyard. He thought he was Scarface. He did. I, he literally did. He literally did, yep. actually. Yep. He thought he was Scarface. I don't know, man. Yeah. I Obviously, he made a lot of money in the past, and he misused it big time. Um, and and he talks about that, by the way. Mike Tyson talks about that at a high level, like in any podcast that they ask him questions about that. And he talks about it. He says, you know, he says he's much happier now than he was when he had all that money, you know, that he's in a much better place in his life than he ever was before. You know, yeah, watch, that he watch, you know what you should watch? You should watch the interview when Mike Tyson interviews Oscar De La Hoya. Oh, yeah? Oh, man, that's an amazing interview, dude. Oscar talks Oscar, Oscar talks about his childhood. Um, that's a really, really good. It's long, but it's good, bro. It's really, really good. Because you got two boxers who were kind of in the like, same. Really did it. Yeah, both champions, like really dominating all of their weight classes. And it was crazy to like to actually hear like what they were battling internally, like you know, and yeah, and they showed, and they showed up. Yeah. Where where did you see it? Is that something you could find on YouTube or something? You should be able to find it on YouTube because I think that's where I saw it, like Oscar De La Hoya. Right. Um, yeah, Cause, cause Tyson got right podcast. Tyson got a podcast. Yeah, yeah. Oscar was a guest on the podcast. 
Nice. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna check that out because that, check it out. that it's, seems it's like a really good interview. Oscar talks about his childhood and his mom, like, and you find out. And I don't know if you ever seen Oscar's De La Hoya's in uh, um uh HBO documentary. Man, and you find out that like when Oscar was fighting and the world was cheering, Oscar became a huge star because his mom died, and Oscar went on national TV and basically said, "Hey, you know." My mom's my dream was to always win a gold medal, and I told my mom I was going to win this for my mom, and this is for my mom. And you find out that was all a lie, like they lied to the world, like it wasn't real. It's crazy. You need to watch it. It's wild, man. He and he talks about it. He talks about Woo! how it was a lie. He talks about how it was a lie, and they made it all up to make money, and they started seeing their, their that's response. what they forced them to say, basically. Yeah, and they started seeing the response they were getting from it, and they ran with it, and it was all a lie. Oscar story is wild. Man. Yeah, that's crazy. That's yeah, you should crazy. watch that. One. Absolutely. I'm going to check that out. Dude, like this has been a fantastic conversation, by the way. And I know a lot of people listening to this heard us go off on a tangent, which is perfectly fine, man. Because honestly, I didn't know about this interview. I'm sure a bunch of people didn't know about it either. You know, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of comments where they're like, Screw this YouTuber, you know, and then other people would be like, I love this YouTuber. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I ain't worried about that shit. I somebody just, asked me, like, somebody asked know, me about something like yesterday, and I'm like, everything's not for everybody, man. If it ain't for you, then tune off, bro. Don't listen to it. Go do something else. Go bake some yeah. cookies. There's, you know, you got this kid, Anthony Joshua, uh, the British, the British boxer, fighting yeah. in the heavyweight class. Yeah. And he just had a fight this weekend. With uh, with Francis, uh, how do you say his name? Nagao. The you the the, and, the, the and, yeah yeah. I mean, I need to talk about. I need to talk about. Yeah, he knocked him out, like killed him on in the ring, and now everybody's like, "Oh my God, AJ's back," you know. And I kind of feel like AJ has an opportunity to be the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world if he plays his cards right. You know, yeah, I think, I think uh, it was going good for him. I, I believe he changed his camp. If I'm right, doesn't he yep. train with? Um, doesn't he train with the same dude that Earl Spence used to train with? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think sometimes for these fighters too, you know, who've had the same trainers for their whole life, you know, sometimes they get to a point where they need to learn something new. You know, and yeah, I mean, he's pick. got 31 fights, 31 fights, three losses, uh, 25 yeah. knockouts. Yeah, like it's amazing. a great record for a heavyweight. That's a great record. Great, great you record. You know what I mean? Let's face it, heavyweights and, anything and, you can punch. Yep. And dudes, 6'6, 6'6, 245 pounds. Like solid. Yeah. So it's 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 I miss real deal heavyweight boxing. I miss the Tysons. I miss the Holy Fields. I miss I miss the two monsters getting into the ring and and tactfully going to kill each other you know what i mean like call it what you want boxing is one of my favorite sports i enjoy it i like it and and i i'm not a big fan like i like boxing but i'm not a big fan of like the super lightweights like the guys that are like 120 pounds and like you know if, if not like anything people, like, up. like 140s and up i'm cool with it yeah you know i could deal with the 140 160 and up I'm in, you know what I mean? It's got to look like a powerful fight, man. I, I like some of these fights, you look like it, like 35, 135. I feel, like they, yeah, I, feel, I feel like they turn off the AC so they don't fly off the fucking, you know, the ring. The ring. Like, <laughs> flyweight, yeah. You know? weights, yeah. And, and being a guy that's like, I'm, you know, I, I'm not the biggest guy in the world, but I'm 215 at 5'11, you know what I mean? And so, so, Kind of like looking at some of these guys and going, oh my god, this guy's five four, hundred twenty five pounds. Like, it's crazy. It's like, yeah, oh. you know, it's insane, man. I mean, but but God willing, we get a strong heavyweight again. It's what we need, you know. I, I'm looking forward to see what happens with Anthony Joshua next. They're saying that Tyson Fury is supposed to fight him again. See what happens. They're saying Fury is going to run from it. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see yeah. what happens next with AJ. He hasn't, he hasn't really ran from anything. So, I mean, I think for the most part, I mean, be a good fight. I don't know. You're saying that Fury doesn't really want to do it. So, be a good fight. I mean, Anthony, I mean, I, I feel like he deserves it anyway now with, you know, change of training camp and stuff like that. So, probably makes a whole yep. different fight. 
And maybe Fury don't want that fight because maybe he just feels like, man, this guy looks different from when I fought him the last time. So you might be right yeah. on there too. Yeah. 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 Brother, thanks for having this conversation with me. It's been amazing. I like to do this. this is- Dude, by the way, we got into some business stuff, which is great. We got into some family life, which is great. We got into some sports, which is amazing. You know, great opportunity for us to connect, you know, and and create this. You know, we're 45 minutes in on this, and I hope that folks enjoyed the conversation that we brought to the table. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are listening right now, um, you know, reach out to either one of us, anything you need, you know, you got one of us in Miami, one of us in Orlando, reach out, comment in the comments below. We're going to make sure that all of Richard's information is in the comments. So you'll be able to tag him and find him and all that good stuff. And, uh, dude, we appreciate you doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, It's an honor. Sorry. Everyone who's watching right now, make sure you subscribe, like, comment, share, let us know how you feel about this. And uh, we'll see you guys soon enough. Thanks again, brother. Later, guys.